dynamics around that. But today we're going to think about a story about pr probably the most commonly mentioned person in, in the Gospels, in the stories of Jesus, and that's Peter. And we're going to think about in Luke chapter 5 where um, Jesus encounters Peter. And in Luke 5, uh, in verses 1 to 11, that's what we're going to be thinking about. What, what we find is Jesus is teaching the crowd in the first couple of verses and the crowd have heard about his miracles and they're kind of uh, crowding around him and they're pushing him further back and further back and, and Jesus is getting to the edge of the lake of the Sea of Galilee and, and the crowd is still coming and Jesus looks around and, and he sees to the side of him a, a couple of empty fishermen boats. The fishermen are not there, they're, they're with their nets and they're cleaning the nets because they've been out fishing all night. And Jesus sees one of the boats and one of the boats belongs to Peter, who Jesus has already met. Jesus has healed his mother-in-law, so they've had uh, previous um, conversations, encounters. And Jesus sees Peter and he said, listen, I want you to take me out in the boat. And Jesus wants to go out into the water in Peter's boat and he wants to keep teaching the crowd. He wants to, so they can all see him and they can kind of hear him and he can carry on teaching them and instructing them. And so Peter agrees to do that. What Peter doesn't realise is that what's going to happen next is probably his most significant encounter with Jesus of his life. Maybe the most significant moment of his life. And um, he, Jesus takes him out and then after Jesus has finished teaching the crowd, he, he says to Peter, he said, I want you to take me out into the deep waters and I want you to throw your nets over the side. I actually want you to start fishing. And uh, Peter says that he's been fishing all night and he hasn't caught anything and it's the wrong time of day and it's the wrong place to be fishing. And, uh, but he, he does what Jesus says and he, and he throws his nets over the side and he hasn't been catching anything. And suddenly he gets this massive haul of fish, uh, which totally stuns and, and astonishes uh, Peter. And he ends up just uh, in awe and reverence of Jesus and his power. And, and then Jesus says to him, listen, what I want you to do is to give up all this and I want you to be part of my team and you're going to work with me to spread my movement uh, all around the world and we're going to make a massive difference and, and Peter responds by, by agreeing to follow Jesus and become part of his team and um, it's just a significant moment in the history of the world really it's the history of the church and in the in Peter's life as well this kind of understanding of who Jesus is and being inspired to follow Jesus but I wonder whether Peter ever looked back to that moment as Jesus was stood on the shore and he looked around and he just happened to see Peter's empty boat. And I wonder whether Peter wonders what happens if it was somebody else's boat. Or I wonder if Jesus knew I was going to be there. Or I wonder if it was part of God's plan for me to be there and for my boat to be there and for Jesus to have me push him out onto the onto the sea and uh, and I don't know about you but sometimes I've wondered about things that have happened in my life and, and coincidences or how come that's there or how does that fit together with that and certainly when I was younger I would want to understand how everything fits together and I understand what God's purpose for my life is and what is he doing in my life and what's the next step and how does it all fit together and when things happen in in job situations or in ministry situations to think well, well what God's doing here and did he mean this to happen and uh, sometimes I go around in circles and circles and get pretty confused but I love this simple story because Jesus is just there and he looks at the boat and he says to Peter I want you to take me out in the boat and Peter just says yes and, and in all our lives and we wonder why things are happening or how come I'm in this situation or how come this is going on, what, what I've learned as I've kind of got older and more experienced in the spiritual life that actually the key is not to understand why everything's happening. The key is not to understand how come I'm here and there's an empty boat and Jesus is there and how come all this is happening and I didn't fish in the night and I didn't get any fish and uh, what's God's plan in it all. That, that As I've got older I've learned actually the key is just to obey Jesus in the moment that if Jesus says I want to get in that boat out onto the lake that I just say yes to Jesus and I might not understand why and I might not understand what become before what comes after but just to say yes and, and to just trust that God's kind of working his purposes out and it all fits together in God's plan that I might not understand any of that but sometimes it's good to acknowledge our smallness just to say actually in the moment what's Jesus asking me to do
And, and I don't know where you are just now and kind of what's going on in your life. And, and maybe you're just wondering and asking all sorts of things. Um, but sometimes it's good just to keep it simple and be in that situation with Jesus and just be like, well, what's, what's Jesus asking me to do? I don't need to understand it all, but what's Jesus asking me to do? But I think probably the most significant thing is, is just to think for a second where the question actually happens. It's really important to, to notice where this encounter happens for, for Peter. Uh, because Peter isn't in a synagogue, he's not in a religious building, he's not in a religious service. He, he's actually in his workplace. He's come in the end of his work day, he's cleaning off all his uh, nets. And then when Jesus asks him to get into the boat, he's asking him to get into uh, one of the equipment that he uses for his workplace. And, and sometimes when people are really interested in encountering Jesus or, or they've thought, actually, what's life all about? They, they think, actually, I need to go somewhere. I need to go to kind of a special spiritual location. I need to kind of get myself all dressed up. I need to get my, my life sorted out. I need to get into a different place in order to meet Jesus, in order to, for God to kind of accept me. And but what you get here is Peter. This is the most significant encounter with Jesus, the most significant moment of his life. And it happens by Jesus getting into Peter's boat, into his workplace. And wherever you are just now, you know, you might be in lockdown and, and you live in a house on your own. And uh, you may be struggling with mental health issues. You may be in a place where you're unemployed and, and the job market's fallen through the floor and, and you're feeling you just don't know what to do with yourself. You, you may be in a place where you're just overwhelmed with a job that's thrilling and exciting. Uh, or maybe you spend a lot of your time looking after kids. Uh, wh wherever you are, wherever you kind of find yourself, that's where Jesus wants to encounter you. The Jesus doesn't say, well, you need to sort yourself out. You need to kind of get your life together. You need to get into a spiritual place, a spiritual job. You need to go somewhere else. Jesus doesn't say, you've got to get yourself sorted to enter my world. What, what Jesus says is, actually, I'm going to come into your world. Wherever you find yourself, it's possible to encounter Jesus there. Peter encountered Jesus, his most significant encounter was in his workplace. And wherever you are, wherever you find yourself, you don't have to go somewhere else. You don't have to become someone else in order to encounter Jesus. What Jesus wants to do is to enter your world and to meet with you and encounter you right there. You just need to take a moment just to stop maybe just to be quiet maybe just to say those words Jesus Jesus over and over again just close your eyes and sit quietly maybe just grab a couple of moments in your day in your workplace wherever it might be that's where Jesus wants to encounter you and, and have you ever thought about Jesus asking Peter to go out onto the boat and uh, so you can go on the water and so Jesus can teach the crowd have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus didn't need Peter? I mean, if you read some of the other stories of Jesus, you'll know that Jesus can walk on water. Jesus doesn't need Peter. He doesn't need Peter's boat. But he's one of the, the most incredible things that I've found out about Jesus and about God is he chooses to need us. He chooses to need Peter's boat so he can go out and teach. He chooses to need your skills and your relationships and your money and your time. There's people on your street, maybe that are lonely through lockdown and Jesus wants to comfort them. And he could just magically comfort them however he wanted to. But what he tends to want to do is to use you and to use me, to use our time and our telephones and our words and our cards and our money to, to bless and serve other people. Just like Peter said, Jesus said to Peter, I want to use your boat so I can get out to the crowd and teach them. I want to use what you've got. I want to use your skills. And I've never quite worked out why God wants to use us. Why doesn't he just do it? I think it's something about the joy of partnership, maybe. Something about the joy God has of being with us and doing things with us. But God is looking at you right now in this season. He's saying, I want to use you. I want to use what you've got. I want to use your contacts and your wisdom and your words. And, and don't say that you haven't got anything because God's given you loads of things. He's just saying, can I use it? Can I use it to bless others? And maybe you want to take a moment in silence and just ponder and say, God, what is it you want?
me to do? What is it you want to use of mine? How do you want to serve the vulnerable in my community right now? But perhaps the most exciting thing about the story is the miracle of the fish and what that symbolises. And um, there's so much that's really kind of interesting about the fish and, and the miracle of the fish where Jesus says to Peter, I want you to throw your nets over. I want you to go fishing again. And Jesus is a carpenter. He doesn't know anything about fishing. And, and Peter's an expert. He, he's done it for, for, for many years, probably. And he knows that there isn't any fish. And then Jesus says, in the daytime, I want you to go fishing. Now, that's the wrong time to go fishing. You should go fishing at night when the, when the fish come out from the rocks. They tend to hide during the day. And he takes him out to the deep, out to the middle. Jesus has taken Peter to the wrong place. Uh, you should be fishing more on the edge where there might be fresh streams coming into the lake, where the fish might gather. And, and Peter, I, I don't think that it, there's a grand obedience going on here. You've got Peter, maybe out of exasperation, maybe because Jesus has healed his mother-in-law or whatever. But Jesus, say, uh, Peter says, OK, I'll do it. And he throws them overboard the nets and he's just overwhelmed with the fish this massive provision now it's important to understand kind of what's just happened here for Peter because what what's happened is that Jesus has just shown him a massive source of wealth you know in Peter's profession if you can find a source a massive source of fish you know that's like um, if you're a salesman and, and you just find a customer who wants to buy millions of pounds worth of goods, you know, or you uh, discover a vaccine for COVID or something like that, you know, it's, it's a massive source of, of wealth that Peter um, finds that Jesus has got. And, and Jesus essentially is, is saying, I've got all the wealth. Do you know what I mean? I've got power over money. And I found that to be true as well in my own life, that Jesus does have all the provision of, of money. You know, he, he can provide. If you're struggling just now, it's possible Jesus can provide. He's just law over everything, over all sorts of things, including wealth and, and money. But that's probably not the most remarkable thing. The most remarkable thing is not that Jesus can just produce money and wealth out of anywhere. Although he's done that for me in my life and I know for many of you, God's done that as well. That when you've trusted him, when you've been faithful to him, when, when he's asked you to give money away or to tithe or maybe to take a low paid job that's more meaningful. When you've trusted him, you've found him to be the source of money, the source of wealth, the source of provision, that he is somebody you can trust. But, but the remarkable thing in the story, I don't think, is even the fish and the miraculous producing of the fish. The, the culture and world that we live in that thinks money is so important, then it's what happened next that I think is really surprising. You see, I'm, I'm sure that, G, that Peter would have been amazed by Jesus, who, who had this kind of, this clever knowledge, the supernatural knowledge about where there might be a source of fish, this kind of extra supply. It, it's like he, he'd won the, the fishing lottery his fishing business, Peter's fishing business might be successful for, for a long time, having found out the secret source of fish that he could maybe keep fishing in for, for weeks, months, maybe maybe even longer than that. And the incredible thing is, is what happens next, that, that Peter's business immediately becomes very prosperous. Uh, Jesus demonstrates that he's lord over money, he's lord over power, over, over creation. And then Jesus says to Peter, who is in this sense of awe and wonder and worship, you know, you know, I've been that place as God provides, you're just in a place of awe and wonder and amazement at his power at what he's able to do. And then Jesus says this to Peter, he said, and now I want you to leave it all. I want you to leave it all and come with me to make a difference in the world. Come and help me fish for people. Help me come and spread my message so that we can see lives transformed. He says to Peter, in effect, that, that I've got the power to produce any sort of wealth whenever I want to, but it's not that important. I've got the ability to produce all sorts of wealth, and in fact, I've just done it for your business, but it's actually not that important, and I want you to leave it 
and follow me. I mean, if he'd invited Peter to leave a struggling business, maybe Peter might have thought, well, I've got nothing, another other option. But he, he's inviting Peter to, to leave a prosperous business. And Peter himself looks at Jesus and says, I'm in. Something about his encounter with Jesus means that he wants to follow Jesus rather than be rich and have this prosperous business. And both those kind of truths are really important that actually God can provide. God's access, got access to money. God can make us wealthy. God can give us what we need. God's in control of all that and he can do it whenever he wants. But at the same time, there's this kind of twin truth of it's, it's not actually that important to have all the money that you want, to have a successful business, to be wealthy. It's not the ultimate ultimate. There's something more significant than that. And, and that's been about God's purposes and God's kingdom purposes. And, and sometimes people can tend to emphasise one of those over the other. And, and so you get people that get labelled part of the prosperity movement, prosperity gospel, that God can provide, God can make us rich, God can bless us in all sorts of ways. But they kind of leave it at that and say, so you should follow God, you should pray, you should read your Bible in order to become rich and, and kind of accidentally putting riches and money at the centre where God said, well, yeah, I can do that, but it's a bit neither here nor there, is it? It doesn't really matter. It's not that important to have lots of money and to be rich. And, and that's deeply challenging for, for many of us. It's deeply challenging for the culture I live in to think actually it doesn't really matter to be part of a culture I'm part of a culture that's the richest in the world that's the richest that probably has ever existed uh, for many many people we have access to things that people could have only dreamed of in generations gone by yet probably many of us feel quite poor even though we're the richest people in the world we're, we're the richest people who've ever lived perhaps uh, but even so Jesus is like it's not that important and he wants Peter to kind of reorder his heart and his life to think, actually, this is the power. This is the sort of person I am, Jesus says. This is what I can achieve. This is what I can do. But it's not that important. You know, I can remember reading a novel called The Testament by John Grisham. And uh, there's a moment in that novel that, that God really spoke to me. And, and it's a story of a, of a re very rich American who dies and he leaves an inheritance. Uh, but they're struggling to find any members of the guy's family. And it's an absolute fortune and people start scrabbling over who, who deserves the money. And eventually they find a, a relative who is the closest relative who's due, due, due money. Uh, but she's a missionary. She's working in some deep dark place or, or um, away from civilization. And so the story really is about this lawyer who has to set off on this massive trip to find her, to tell her that she's due like millions and billions of, of pounds. And I remember in the story, the bit that really struck me is when she, when this lawyer, you know, and it's all this story of going on the boat and going through the darkest jungle and eventually reaching the woman and, and to tell her. And I can remember just as a, you know, as a Christian, who's someone who who's tries to be about God's purposes, thinking wow this is a massive opportunity for her just to think about all the good she can do with all this money all the power that it gives her and, and although it was only a novel it was interesting how, how Grisham portrayed her reaction because as the lawyer turns up and tells her that she's got all this money she's not bothered she doesn't care about it because money's a bit neither here nor there and I remember as I read that story and almost kind of disagreed with her initial reaction God, God spoke to me and, and God was like you think money's so powerful don't you actually there's things that are more powerful than that that actually money doesn't matter as much as we sometimes think that it does and so for Peter he, he chooses to give up that opportunity of a prosperous business because there was something about Jesus from Peter's encounter with Jesus and experience of Jesus there was something about Jesus that drew him in that made him think that being a part of the Jesus movement being wherever Jesus is is more significant is more interesting is more powerful is more life-giving than all the money that 
I might get from Lake Galilee. And, and then the rest of this here is, is history. Jesus becomes part of the Jesus movement and there's a few ups and downs, but he becomes a leader in the early church and eventually he, he dies because of his love and his commitment to Jesus. And it all began with that encounter by the lake shore where Jesus was there and Jesus said, Peter, can you take me out in your boat? And for whatever reason, Jesus was there and Peter was there and, and Peter responded with a, with a yes. And he took him out onto that boat that Jesus entered Peter's world, Peter's workplace. After a frustration and an unproductive night of work, that's the place where he encountered Jesus. Because Jesus wants to encounter our world wherever we are, wherever you are right now. And then Jesus took him out onto the lake and after he's finished teaching he, he said I want you to throw the nets overboard and Peter had had that night of fishing and no luck but he did what Jesus said and he was in awe at the power and the provision of Jesus because Jesus is Lord over wealth and money and he can provide for us whenever he wants and that discovery that actually Jesus himself is more valuable is more precious than anything else. Like, like Paul, a fellow church leader, he said, all I once thought gain, everything else I thought was really important compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus. It's all worthless. It all just doesn't count. I wonder if you've had that experience where you've encountered Jesus and you've looked at everything else that you've got and you thought, actually, none of it compares to knowing Jesus. Have you met the real Jesus? Have you come face to face with him? Maybe if you, you haven't, or if it's been a long time, maybe you wanna just give some time this week. Maybe you wanna go for a walk, get out into the fresh air, the countryside, get open to your Bible and look at Luke 15 or another story of Jesus and just invite God to speak to you, to show you what it can be so life-giving. What's so precious about knowing Jesus that it makes everything else worthless? in comparison let me just pray for me and let me pray for you father i just want to pray for us that you may reveal jesus to us that you may help us have a real encounter to jesus that we may give up a bit of time today this week just to seek you to read the stories of jesus and ask you to speak to us once afresh and as we do that will you come by your spirit and will you stir up in us a desire to follow you and to serve you and change the world so that you will get more glory. Amen.
Hi, my name is Emma and I'm a leader here at Hope Church, Oswestry. And up until recently, my experience of church was going to a church building on a Sunday morning and then midweek perhaps going to people's houses for my home group. And that's how I'd build my church community, that's how I'd connect with people and that is how my faith would grow. But in March that changed for all of us, didn't it? And it changed the way we did church. Um, we focus on our live stream on a Sunday on YouTube now. We um, focus on our reflections that we've had and our wisdom bites that we have midweek. And also everything else went on Zoom, didn't it? Our prayer meetings, our home groups and any other meeting you could possibly think of went on to Zoom. And that has been great because it's meant that we've still been able to see each other and link together with each other. But sometimes it's not enough, is it? Sometimes it's not enough just to listen to something uh, on a screen. It's not enough to listen to somebody speak to us on a screen and not, not have a place to go where we can share those ideas with people, we can chat and we can talk. And that is because we weren't designed for our faith to grow alone. We're designed for our faith to grow as part of a community where we can connect with each other, a community where we can encourage one another, um, a community where we feel safe to ask questions and then our faith can continue to grow. And I think at this time it's really important to be able to carry on doing that. So at Hope Church we've been thinking around how do we do that together and we are we are launching an online community, a place where if you've connected with us once or whether you've connected with us many times you are more than welcome to join and that's going to be one central place online where we can come together, ask questions, chat together, share things and build our community together and grow in our faith together. And simply the way we're going to be doing that is by setting up a Facebook group. As Hope Church Oswestry, we already have a Facebook page and from that Facebook page, we're going to be launching a Facebook group. So I want to encourage you at this moment to look out for that Facebook group. We're launching that on November the 22nd and that will be a really exciting place for us. An exciting place where we can grow together, we can share together and also have fun together. So I want to encourage you on November the 22nd to join with us and join our online community at Hope Church Oswestry Facebook group. See you there. Trust that you've heard God speak to you through this service and it's managed to kind of reset your heart for the week, give you a, give you a focus. And uh, if you want to be on our mailing list, we email out every week notices of what we're up to and what sort of resources, digital resources we're providing. Uh, or you want to get in touch with us generally, then you can do that on our website, hopechurchosstreetorguk slash connect. If you go there, there's a form where you can send us a message. If you've got a question or you just want to sign up to our mailing list, you can do that. And uh, check out our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe to it, like it, please share it. And you can see all the dots of resources we do. There's lots of stuff for kids as well. If you're a family and you've got young uh, children, uh, different resources. Every Sunday we provide them for our three age groups. So go over to our YouTube channel and you can see what we're, we're up to there. Um, but uh, thank you for being with us. If you want to be part of our Zoom chat right now, if you're watching live, we have a Zoom chat and the details will come up right after the service where we just for half an hour uh, catch up on news and see each other. And uh, you can come and be part of that if that's what you want. But let me just pray for you, pray for me as we head into our week. And Father, we just thank you that you're present with us. And we just pray for your blessing as we head into the week, that you may sustain us, that we may get a sense that you are close to us, 
that we may open our hearts to you each day. Come Holy Spirit, give us the strength we need to do the things you've called us to do. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you again soon.